The content of this podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be construed as financial or investment advice. The views and opinions expressed in this podcast are those of the hosts and their guests. They do not necessarily reflect the position of any associated employers or organizations. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Applied MMT podcast. We have another special guest today, uh, Marin Poitras, who is the filmmaker behind the MMT documentary titled Finding the Money. We're very excited to have Marin on the show today. Um, she actually allowed us to view a private screening of Finding the Money, and I think Ryan, Doug, and I were all very impressed with it. Um, so with that, we'll get started. Marin, would love to hear maybe some of your background and then also just how you, you know, first came to be interested in MMT and what inspired you to, to make this great film. Yeah, no, thanks. Um, and yeah, very happy to be here. So, um, yeah, you know, I, I, like I was saying, I kind of came across the film, uh, from a climate background. So, uh, my background is more in, you know, environmental studies, climate, agriculture, and really trying to understand these big picture issues, you know, and how can we address some of these big systemic challenges and problems, not just climate, but inequality too, you know, so many of our other big social problems, how can we address them more on a systemic level? Um, and so in doing, starting to delve into some of that, you know, first I found ecological economics, and then there was just like a random quote in a book that said, oh, and you know, banks create money too. And I was like, wait, what? You know, and that just like, it was just like one sentence and it stopped me. And I was like, what does this mean? You know? And so I just started digging more and, you know, that led me to some of the uh, different, uh, you know, alternative economics types things. There was something called positive money and other ideas floating around. And then eventually, finally got to MMT and things just started to clarify and make sense. And they had a description of the world that just fell into place, you know, and seemed to make intuitive sense. And so, um, but it was such a compelling story in itself that there was this small group of economists, you know, heterodox economists, non-mainstream, and there was so much conflict around the story at the same time. You know, the, the, the established mainstream field um, of the economics profession was, was saying this group was, was crazy and, you know, out of their minds, don't listen to them. So there was a lot of conflict and controversy, and that actually just drew me in more. You know, was, could, it, you know could it be true that this small group um, are saying something that the entire mainstream field has somehow missed, you know, and, and big things like foundational things, right? I mean, the nature of money itself, what is money? Where does it come from? How does it work? And thus, how do our entire economies work? And how could they, you know, maybe work differently or produce different outcomes for people? You know, even the questions, what is the economy for to begin with? You know, is it just to grow itself and, you know, kind of feed feed humans into this economic machine to produce something we call economic growth, or is the economy a tool in itself to provide for, you know, human well-being and, you know, hopefully planetary sustainability at the same time, because we live on one planet. But long story short, you know, I came to the story of MMT, it seemed like information that was not widely understood, um, and to say the least. And uh, no one else was, I, I went out, I went around being like, you know, who, who is going to tell this story in a movie? Cause it's clearly, uh, you know, it's clearly an important story. It has all the elements of a story of conflict, um, and really, really important and urgent ramifications, um, if what they're saying is correct. So, um, so I went around trying to figure out who else might be working on this and no one else really was. So I guess I just kind of took it on myself, um, and it's been a, a journey ever since. But um, yeah, there's a real urgency, I think, driving me forward in terms of are we going to act, you know, on the speed and scale necessary to address the climate crisis um, and keep our economies, you know, and people sustained as well at the same time. Um, so, yeah, uh, long story short. Awesome. And what what time period was that? So you, you found out about MMT when and then like when did you actually kick off creating the film? Yeah, so I think around 2016 or 17, I came across the words, you know, MMT, and then just started diving into any book I could find. Um, so of course, that was Randy Ray's, you know, uh, primer uh, on modern money theory, modern mon money theory, um, as he likes to call it. And then, um, as I was saying, I went to the the first MMT conference finally in 2018. So that was after doing a lot of reading, because, you know, I was pretty skeptical at first, too. I was like, this doesn't make any sense. What are they saying? Like, 
money is debt too, or so, you know, like that was a sticking point for me. And I just like, couldn't get past a few things. Um, and so it was a lot of piecing together, you know, and then finally, you know, there were, there were moments of those clarities and like moments of it clicking and those kind of like aha moments, right. Through my reading and trying to piece together the pieces of the puzzle. Um, and so those were really gratifying, you know, and it's like, I wanted to share that, like, how can I encapsulate these aha moments and guide people through that journey, hopefully in a shorter time frame than two years, um, condense that down to 95 minutes. And hopefully you can have that same experience in a way of having revelations and having things fall into place. So, um, so then I went to go meet folks in person in 2018 at the MMT conference. And then I began shooting in early 2019, which was really kind of the time when uh, the Green New Deal was first proposed by AOC you know, in January of 2019. And then she just mentioned MMT once and it was off to the races. You know, they just started getting tons of coverage um, in the print and TV. And, and then of course, a lot of, you know, a lot of controversial coverage, but you know, no, no press is bad press as they say. Right. So, um, so this was an exciting time to kind of be, be trying to follow them and trying to capture that moment. Um, and as it continued to, you know, who knew that COVID was coming and, you know, who knew what was what was all coming in the future? So I've just kind of been following that journey, and then a long, long editing process of trying to rein in this very complex subject and story. Right. Right. Well, you did a great job of it, and I think um, I think you know Ryan, Doug, and I all had kind of similar experiences with MMT and addressed it in different ways. Like I, I started my previous podcast after having a similar experience, and uh, right. you know Ryan and Doug also. I'm, I'm sure felt similarly when they first found out about MMT. <laughs> um, Marn, can you tell us what, so I know you've, I know you've done a few screeners of the film um, already. Um, can you tell us more about those and, and how those have gone so far? Yeah, definitely. So we premiered at Woodstock Film Festival in, in around October, 2023. And so we've just played at about like five film festivals um, and now we're, you know, gearing up for really exciting 2024, where we're finally going to, you know, release the film widely. We're going to do a limited theatrical release in probably early May okay. um, 2024. Awesome. So hopefully you can go to your local theater and see it. I mean, it won't be in that if you're in a major city or please, you know, contact us, request. If you think you can bring out an audience to your local theater, let us know. Um, and also, if you want to put on a, a campus screening, a community screening, we're very open to all that. So please, you know, go to our website findingmoneyfilm.com. You can contact us. Um, and so, yeah, we just want to do the more screenings we can do, the better. And I really encourage, I really think this is a great movie to watch with an audience. Like you guys didn't get to watch it with an audience, but I really encourage you to still go um, when we premiere in New York and watch it with an audience because it is, it's actually a fun one to hear the reactions and to like, yeah, to be in it with, with an audience. There are actually a lot of reactions that happen through the film that I wasn't sure you know, how it was going to play. So the first time I watched it with an audience was at, at Woodstock in, in um, at the Woodstock Film Festival. And yeah, the audience reaction was, was great. Uh, you know, I loved it. And then, um, you know, we continue, we've played it a few more and they've just, they've been terrific as well. Um, and very kind of consistent um, responses, kind of very similar consistent responses. Um, you know, there's the scene 10 minutes in um, and I wasn't <laughs> sure how the reactions were going to go, but I, I, I loved it. So um so anyhow, they, uh, yeah, it's, it's been very gratifying and, you know, everyone coming up after we've, we've usually been able to, to stay, do Q and A's, um, discussions, maybe Stephanie Kelton's there or other protagonists from the film have been there. Um, so, so yeah, I really recommend coming out and seeing it in person and then being able to discuss and ask questions after, because this is, you know, it is only an intro, right? Because mm -hmm. there's only so much you can cover in 95 minutes. There's a lot more I wanted to cover and there's a lot more implications. So um, you're going to have maybe more questions than answers ne necessarily at the end. Um, so it's important to be able to, you know, I think have that avenue to ask questions and discuss um, because there's there's a lot um, that this might bring up. So, um, so yeah, the screenings, in-person screenings are great. I encourage folks to go out and then it'll, you know, and then it'll be available on digital rental at home if you do prefer that. Um, but, but yeah. Awesome. 
Well, I, I'll speak for, for Ryan, who's also located in the New York area. If, if you need help arranging a screening, I think we'd be happy to, uh, to collaborate on that. Yeah. Uh, Absolutely. Just, yeah, I also, and we talked, we, we talked about this, uh, before we, we went live over here, but I just want to, um, say again, that I watched it with my wife and she, uh, <laughs> she loved it as well. And, you know, she, she kind of gets sick of me sometimes, uh, talking about all this MMT stuff. And so I just found it to be, uh, you know, uh, it, it makes the, the topic very approachable to, um, those who, who may not be as, you know, economics or you know uh finance uh inclined so um yeah no a, a, a amazing film and, and definitely one for the masses uh, thanks so much yeah that was definitely my goal is to reach a mainstream audience so not folks who already know about mmt necessarily even though they're such an important group but um <clears throat> yeah we really you know that's been a really good test like we went to bend film festival and some others and you know there was a big audience there of just clearly general audience of people who had never heard about MMT before. And mm. yet, you know, they, and, and it really clicked and they're really absorbed. And, you know, because th- there have, there's always, you know, everyone experiences these questions. It's a, it's a fundamental political question. And I think one that we all have to grapple with when we're voting, you know, and, uh, is, you know, understanding the national debt. What is the national debt? We've heard about it our whole lives. It's a terrible burden on our grandchildren, you know, blah, 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 blah. And, you know, and but everyone like in the back of their minds, they're like, is it really because, you know, nothing bad has exactly happened like that we've been warned for decades and decades and decades. Um, and, you know, and we also know, on the other hand, that, you know, really, the government prints the money, right, or quote, unquote, or, you know, that's where the money comes from. On some level, people understand that they know that. And so they're two very contradictory things. You know, it's like, what is the national debt then? And so I think people are surprisingly very open to it. They want to know about it. It's something they care about. Um, you know, some people, it's one of their biggest issues that they vote around, or especially, you know, in 2008, 2012, you know, 2012 election, this stuff was just huge. I mean, it established the right. Tea Party. Is it, you know, so much, I mean, this is not just, a, you know, back, you know, just for wonks. This is, I think, for everyday people, and it's kind of essential, um, essential understandings to, to think about as a society what's possible and what can we really afford in terms of our real limits, not kind of the limits we've been told in terms of money or the national debt. Um, there are certainly limits, right? But they're very different, um, I think, than what the common understanding is, right? Or that we're told on every political debate. So yes, please come out. And even if I, I've even been told by folks who have been studying MMT for a long time that they still got something new out of the film, you know, or still some things clicked differently or you know, and, and visualizing things differently, right? So this is the first time we're really trying to visualize some of these concepts. So, um, so yes, hopefully it can be a tool. Definitely. Um, what what would you say? You know, I, I know you said the the response has been pretty consistent across the board. How would you summarize that response uh, for people who are, you know, like enthused by the movie and excited by? Because I, I imagine, you know, at least in my experience, a lot of people their brain kind of just turns off when it comes to MMT and they're mm. not interested for whatever reason, but people that are very interested in it tend to be, you know, t- tend to develop an interest and continually, um, you know, stay interested in MMT. How would you describe like the, the, the audience reception to the film in general? Yeah, it's a good question, you know, and I'm not sure. It's like, do you follow up with folks <laughs> right. years later and be like, Dude, how did this impact your life? No, I mean, I, ha- I do keep hearing back from people that, you know, that it's changed the way they think about money. And now when they watch the news, they look at it in a very different perspective, you know, and they're mm-hmm. like, you know, they're like, they continue to think about it. It's stuck with them. Um, and again, these are folks that, that haven't heard of MMT before. Um, and so that's what's really gratifying is just general folks who say, this changed my perspective. And it is, it's the old kind of cliche saying that maybe comes from Warren Moser. It's like, once you see it, you can't unsee it. Right. Um, so yeah. I'm hoping, <laughs> yeah, I'm hoping this film, like if people see it enough, you know, it, it'll it start impacting every, every time you hear on the news about a government shutdown or debt ceiling or what can we afford? We can't find the money or how are you going to pay for it? You know, inter- interest rates, inflation, everything, right? Um, hopefully this gives you a different foundation, a different perspective to think about those, those issues and, and maybe question them differently or figure out what your own opinion is about them. Um, so I think, you know, obviously for some people, it's going to drive you down a road that maybe all of us went down, which was being like, you know, wanting to know everything we can about it and really digging into 
to all of it or going to watch the hundreds of hours of podcasts and videos that are online and great articles and books, you know, you can get really into this stuff. Um, or if it's just you watch one movie and that's it. Um, I think either way is maybe fine. Um, but, but yeah, so, so it's for everyone. And I hope, you know, we're certainly hoping to, to interject ourselves into this conversation in an election year, you know, hopefully if the timing is right, if we get kind of lucky, we can break into the mainstream narrative and public discourse around, you know, in an election year where we're talking about the national debt and what can we afford, um, in terms of government spending and programs, especially towards climate change and, and inequality, um, and any other challenges, you know, major challenges we're facing now. So, um, so the question is, you know, can we get some traction this year? Can we make it, you know, a big enough event, get people out to theaters um, where we start to break into the mainstream press um, and, and the public discourse. So that's, that's, I think, really a goal. But, you know, a lot of it, I think, will depend on word of mouth, too. So everyone right. just kind of watching the film, telling your friend, telling a family member or multiple ones that can go enormously far. Um, and so that's what I'm really hoping for is, is word of mouth, um, recommending it to your friends. And so you never know, it can kind of take off on its own, hopefully, fingers crossed. Um, and, you know, hopefully eventually it will be after our theatrical release and then digital rental, the plan is to hopefully get to what they call AVOD or, you know, on, on the internet, on YouTube, um, and that sort of thing so that you can tell anyone in the world to watch it, hopefully not too, in not too long. Definitely. Well, that's very exciting. Mm -hmm. um, would love would love to go into questions, you know, about the you know making the film specifically. I know Ryan has a few written down that he'd love to ask you. Um, Ryan, do you want to do you want to jump into it? Yeah, I guess first thing. So, um, I'm just kind of curious, and I know you know we have some you know finance financial markets people that listen to this podcast and stuff. So, I'm kind of curious about the like how do you uh, how does the whole <clears throat> Um, uh, you know, uh, financing of a of a documentary like this work. Do you do you, do you have to like you have an idea and you go uh, to you you find people to put up money for it or and and like how uh, without getting into numbers or anything else, uh, just kind of just a, 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 a an overview of how that market sort of works. Yeah, if there is one. Um, no, it's very <laughs> bootstrapped. Um, and maybe I should have talked to you guys first, but because um, I'm not in the finance world. Um, and so, you know, the first way I raised money was through a crowdfund campaign. Um, and I guess uh -huh. it was March of 2020. So really great timing. <laughs> um, it was literally like the weekend we were shutting down. Um, but it, maybe it wasn't the worst timing. Like people were really supportive, you know, and engaged and um, I was like, oh God, no one has any money anymore. You know, the stock market just crashed. Um, and so, so that was then, but, um, you know, so I'd shot for that year and just managed to, to edit together a, a teaser. So I had a four minute teaser. Um, and that's when I raised the first little bit of funds from crowdfunding and then, um, you know, applying for lots of grants. We got like one, you know, pick pitch, they call it doc pitch, um, and then, uh, and then we ended up getting private investors and folks who were interested in the subject. Um, and then, yeah, that's, that's kind of the main trajectory, you know, donations. So, um, so it, it was very bootstrapped though. And that's why, wow. you know, I kind of did it on a shoe, very shoestring budget. This is not a, you know, this is not a uh, studio backed or anything backed film. It's very independent. Um, so yeah, I wouldn't recommend it necessarily, you know, it'd be much better if you just have the money and can go make it. But again, this was my first directed film as well. So it's not exactly easy to have someone hand you a large chunk of change and trust that you're going to actually finish this thing because a million films get started. They don't get finished. Um, uh -huh. But, but today, you know, a, luck, you know, a lot of content is coming out. It is getting easier to, to produce films kind of on your own, but um, you know, the technology is more and more accessible, but it is a, it is an endeavor. I have to say that, and I, I can't recommend it actually. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's amazing. I, I, you know, you couldn't even tell because I thought the the production quality was great. Without without giving mm -hmm. away details, I thought the 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 scene where where you introduced Moser was 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 the best. <laughs> just I, I loved the whole like kind of backdrop and everything. I thought that was that was cool and very well done. Yeah, no, um, I love. Yeah, the visuals are beautiful down there. So I wanted yeah. to get that it in there a little like bit. It. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's also so interesting that it was March 2020 because that was basically my 
uh, you know, personal moment of like, okay, clearly, you know, I work in the financial markets and clearly I don't have sufficient understanding of how this all works because this mm-hmm. all seems impossible to me, mm. right? That, you know, that, that oh, we can just, um, you know, uh, pass $2 trillion in spending into legislation and, um, you know, despite what some may tell you, uh, interest rates actually went to zero when we did that. So mm. it's, um, I, I just, I thought to myself at the time, like, okay, I need to uh, take a step back and c- get a better understanding of, of how this all works. Uh, because basically everything that I would have expected to happen um, didn't, didn't happen. So, mm-hmm. um, so yeah, that, that it, it is funny that that's, yeah, that that's definitely a, um, uh, an important an important period I think for a lot of introspection about yeah. how the things actually work. Yeah, um, exactly. mm-hmm. Another another question I have is, and and again, you're ostensibly you know kind of in the in the business of telling a story, right? And like, ha- what have you? Ha- how do we sort of like what's needed for uh, you know communications wise in order? For us to be somewhat critical of you know, people in power, you know, mainstream or orthodox uh, economists, et cetera, without sounding like crazy conspiracy theorists, basically. <laughs> yeah. No. Like, like, what are the stories that <clears throat> that you have found, um, you know, are effect and and the are, are uh, you know effective in that? Because clearly, logic doesn't always work with people. So. Mm. <laughs> Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, and and you're right. I think you know Warren Mosler. I think maybe you know is so logical. And in the '90s, you said, "Here, I'm just going to present this logic, and everyone should get it in a day and change you know change what they're doing and change the way things work." And um, that didn't exactly happen, as we know. <laughs> so um, it t- sometimes it does take more than logic, or it takes really holding people's hands through the logic. But I think it does come down to to story and storytelling. Like that's that's what needs to change is the story we tell about money um, and where it comes from and what it is, because that's, what's really ingrained. And I think that's when I go through, that's really the core of the conflict. Like when I went around and tried to interview as many mainstream economists as I could to understand, you know, just where do they, you know, tell me where MMT goes wrong. Like tell me where in the description of the monetary system do they go wrong and why? And, you know, please. And I just couldn't find anyone who could give me that, that, you know, precise um, description of where, of where they go wrong, or, you know, it was always just platitudes and, you know, oh, well, MMT says, you know, you can print infinite amounts of money, and you'll never cause inflation and never have any bad things happen. And it's like, <laughs> I mean, if, if that's not what MMT is saying, which I haven't seen them ever say that, um, then that's not really a helpful critique. So give me a helpful critique. Um, and, you know, I think you saw the, the you know, the, the best I got was maybe George Selchin, who, you know, lives in a very different, um, maybe um, political realm or political preferences, but, um, you know, accepts, starts with the foundation, like accepting that MMT is an accurate description of the way the monetary system works, and then coming up with some critiques on top of that, and, and that we, we need to be looking at real resources and what, you know, what can we really afford in terms of, of real resources and how much is really available. And that's a critique, but I think it's not actually, you know, it's actually where MMT would like the debate to go, to move to. Right. There is a lot of valid debate that can happen around, let's analyze, you know, what are our real, what is our real resource capacity and what do we want to use? You know, what do we think is a sustainable use of our resources today in terms of saving some for future generations, what have you, you know, there's a lot of debate that can happen in that sphere, a lot of political debate, um, and where our priorities are. That's very valid debates, but MMT is just saying, you know, here, here are the limits, here's how the system, you know, functions. And then there's so much left to politics and what our preferences are, because you can be an ext- you know, extremist authoritarian and have certain priorities and you, or you could be on another, another side and have different priorities. So, um, so anyhow, so where was I going with all this? Um, uh, what was the question again? Sorry, can you remind me? No, just about like the most effective stories and, oh, and yeah, how we story. can sound and and how we can you know be critical without sounding like you know right, crazy right. conspiracy theorists. Right, communicating it. So like the the core of the conflict for me when it when it came down to it, um, interviewing the mainstream economists was just this divergence in an understanding of 
where money comes from and what money is. And mm-hmm. the, so the story we tell about money itself, you know, I, I, it just, it just does seem to go back to this, this feeling and the story we're kind of born with in this culture, at least that like money is gold or money should be gold or money should be real and tangible and have value in and of itself. And we hate the idea that money, it could be paper or could be, you know, printed on something worthless or, or controlled by the government. Um, mm-hmm. You know, it's kind of like, so much of it actually comes down to the ideology of um, free market, private free market, quote unquote, versus government, you know, this mm-hmm. kind of, you know, this, this, this kind of conflict between those two things. And I think the really important story that MMT reveals is that they're, you know, they're intricately interdependent, too. And the story, you know, what comes first is kind of an important facet um, in order, you know, how can we have functioning markets uh, if we don't first have ki- some form of political body and establishment of law um, and enforcement of laws and private property with- in the establishment then of a money and a monetary system and taxation, without all those things first, you know, you just, you don't have a market. Um, so with, you know, <laughs> you need all those things, then you can have a market or you know, then you can have money, then you can have a market. And yet the story that's told, you know, in the economics books, at least, and I think in the minds of most economists alive today is that, you know, the market comes first. The market is the, you know, the fundamental force of the economy is natural, is a natural system and is a naturally balancing system. And the government is just an intrusion, an intrusion upon this natural system. And we'd all be better off if the government just was more hands off, you know, more laissez faire. Right. So, um, so if we're questioning all of that, um, I think, you know, it, it just comes back to, again, the nature of money in the, in the minds is money an object like gold that you have to go out in the world and find dig up out of the ground before you can use it, you know, before the government can use it, or is money more this accounting tool, right? And an organizing tool, a, um, a a ledger of, of accounting that helps us move the real resources of a society to distribute and organize the real resources of the society towards a political goal. Those are two very different concepts of what money is. And that's, I think the root of the conflict and that comes down to the story we tell about money. And I think when I went out to, to search, it was like every every time there was an issue, it seemed to go back to that story of, well, is money something you have to go out and find and dig out of the ground or is it not? Um, and that, that, that seems to be what everything kind of goes back to. Yeah, I, I love that you brought in... Um you know, several, and it wasn't just, you know, any mainstream economist, but we're talking like very high profile mainstream economists, which I think is an important thing to do. And I don't want to give too much away, but that, you know, those interviews were actually some of my favorite parts of the film, because, you know, as someone who's like very familiar with MMT, I think you did a great job of explaining MMT and, you know, adding things like the visualizations of what, you know, what it is that we're talking about when we explain MMT. But I loved that you had an opportunity to just point blank ask these big time economists like Jason Furman and like Jared Bernstein, you know, about their thoughts on MMT, um, because you, you don't often see people get a chance to do that. Mm. And I think it's important to give them a chance to, you know, rebut MMT on the spot if they disagree with it. And I thought, that, you know, just their responses alone, um, it illustrates there's like a big gap in the mainstream understanding of, of, you know, monetary operations, the monetary system in general and what MMT is saying. And I thought that was, um, those were very powerful clips for me. Yeah. Great. Yeah. No, I think for me, for me too, like that, cause that was a big question for me coming in is just, you know, do they like part of, you know, sometimes you hear, is it possible that they really don't understand or haven't come across these, these concepts or, you know, haven't kind of dealt with these fundamental contradictions that seem apparent in their theory. Um, and so my, my big question, you know, sometimes you wonder, is it like, do they know? And it's just a conspiracy and like, they don't want us to know where money comes from. And, um, you know, the, yeah, this kind of conspiratorial aspect, or like, is there some kind of fundamental misunderstanding or disagreement or what is it, you know, what's at the root of this, this conflict that we see playing out on Twitter every day? Mm-hmm. Um, and so, so from those interviews, you know, this is a big question I had and definitely the conclusion I came to and the feeling I came away with after the interviews was that um, it's not a conspiracy. Um, it, it is more of a misunderstanding or 
our disagreement on the level of ideas. Um, and so that, again, it just goes back to the story of, of money that I was just referring to is, you know, can we understand, you know, is money gold or is it something man-made, you know, is it, is it, does money exist in nature or is it a human construct? And in, and in such a way, like, how is it, who has agency over it? Who, you know, what is the politics around it? Um, and that's what makes a lot more sense is that money uh, is created by us, is, is a political institution. Uh, and I think that's really empowering at the end of the day. You know, I think a lot of people come away sometimes when they think, oh, oh we don't want, you know, even the Bitcoin, the cryptocurrency movements, all of this is trying to like almost remove money from the hands of, of government or of politics, you know, hoping that we can have some kind of natural system where money just, you know, exists separate from from politics and somehow manages to function and manages to 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 create a, a perfectly balancing economy where we're all provided for um you know through the laws of supply and demand somehow i don't know but um but i think it's actually very empowering when you understand that money is political and that mm-hmm. in a democracy then we all get to have a say in you know how it functions and who it you know who should benefit and who you know what our goals are for just for using money as a tool for, for what we actually want. You know, money is not the, the objective. I think money is the, the organizing tool to create the world that we actually want to see in terms of h- how we're provided for in our daily lives. Um, right. and, and, you know, just our quality of life and well-being is, is so much dependent on that. So, yes. So I hope people do come away, you know, empowered and, and hopeful for, and inspired from the film that that um, that money isn't out of our hands, you know, that it is up to us to decide how we want the system to function and that we do have the tools and the capacity to address these big challenges in front of us from climate change and inequality, um, that it's not hopeless, that we're not, you know, powerless in the face of money. Money is just this, you know, inevitable force. And this is just this is the only way it is. There's no alternative. Um, all these things were kind of told, I think, and our imaginations are so constrained by the neoliberal kind of mainstream theories of, of, of economics really serve to constrain our imagination of, of what's possible and, and especially for alternatives. And in that way, you could almost say it does feel like a conspiracy that, um, that, that the mainstream wants to say, you know, don't change anything. It's working fine for the folks who are doing well now, but um, there are alternatives. Right. Yeah, I'm on the topic of conspiracy, and I think this is what Ryan was getting at. It's like, you know, anytime you start talking about the Fed with someone, and then especially mm. when you start talking about how, oh, these, you know, this army of PhDs from Harvard, you know, these economists, they're all wrong. Like, it's a very, it is a very, very hard message yeah. to get across to people without sounding crazy. Yeah. Um, but I think, you know, and, and that, again, going back to the clips with the, with the orthodox economists in the, in the film, Um, I think that really helped, you know, make the case for MMT. Um, and I think that was a very important aspect to include. Yeah, no, I mean, it's a huge, I mean, that's the thing is because especially today with climate, with COVID, you know, we are, we, it is important to trust experts a lot of times, right. Or scientists. Um, right. So it's like in our society, like, you know, now we're, there's so many conspiracies around, climate too and COVID and we don't trust the scientists. We don't trust the experts. So in, in those aspects, we're saying, trust the experts. <laughs> like they know what they're talking about. And then over here we have to say, Oh, actually don't trust these PhD experts from Harvard right. in economics. And it's like, how are people supposed to figure this out? I mean, it's kind of right. awful, but right. yeah. um, so I don't really know the answer to that except to say, maybe trust real scientists and economists are not <laughs> real scientists. No offense. <laughs> I think that's a big. I think that's a big advantage we have over the last fifteen years. Is every one of these economists has had to make some sort of call. We've had so many major transitions, economic transitions. We had the Great Financial Crisis in two thousand seven, two thousand eight. We had COVID, right? We had all the Harvard economists and, and every economist telling us if you hold interest rates to zero, you're going to get runaway inflation. But yet you had MMTers saying if you hold interest rates to zero, you're not going to get any inflation at all because uh, you got it backwards. And then everyone was saying that uh, uh, y- you know that that we were going to hit a recession in twenty twenty three because of the higher interest rates. And it was the exact opposite. And um, you have all these economists who have made these calls that you, you don't even have to just argue with them that they're wrong. You can sit there and say, look, <laughs> you've been wrong. <laughs> we have the receipts. <laughs> you've put it out there. You've tweeted this stuff out for the last 10 years. And we're going to hold you accountable to this because this is what you're saying. You consistently get it wrong. And yet you get to sit in these chairs with big titles 
you know what what gives here what gives and uh so at some nice. yeah anyway you're, you're not you guys uh, listeners can't see this but she's not in her head right now in agreement. <laughs> uh, so I, i'll let her jump in here and uh and, and have her hey, take her shots too at, uh, at at what seems to be the absurdity of of economists getting things wrong for 15 years well or much longer i mean it's or, yeah, serious yeah. i mean it's least, seriously well, I, I absurd. 15 years because you know, i've been an adult for 20 some odd years and for the 20 some odd years that i've been an adult every single economist that has been in, in any anywhere close to a policy lever just doesn't understand not only what's going to happen not happen tomorrow but a year from now uh right. five years from now nothing right. they projected has, has come out the right way and it's only been the mmt crowd that seems to have a grasp on what the future might bring given the policy choices that, that get enacted i know i mean you have to wonder like does it matter like does being right matter because somehow economics is like insulated from being right or wrong or, you know, having a, a, being accurate in any way, shape or form. It's like, right. I mean, even Christine Lagarde, whatever her name is, like she just yesterday, or whatever it was on Twitter. It's like, she's, there's such a, a click and they're insulated from, from any kind of critique really on the outside. And I, I, I don't know what's allowed that to happen over the years, but you know, it is, it does feel to me more like, you know, a religion or a priesthood in a lot of ways where you just have to believe, you know, it's, it doesn't matter what the empirical evidence shows or what the data shows. They just go back to the models that don't reflect reality. Um, <laughs> and so I, I, like, I have no answer for that. I mean, people like, I do not understand how you can be wrong infinite amounts of time and still like fail up. Right. I mean, it's the, the definition of failing up. You just get promoted and promoted and promoted until you're chief economist to the president. And so like, I mean, I can't think like that doesn't happen in the real sciences, you know, or in, you know, in the natural sciences, you can't be wrong that many times and still be respected. And so I don't have an answer for that, except that like they just put really complicated math on top of faulty assumptions and then say, oh, it's too difficult for you to understand. Just don't bother. Like, you just have to listen to me. You just have to trust me because you don't understand this. It's too complicated. And so that's where I think that's the only insulation I think they have. And so I think if more people understand the basics in a way, then they can feel empowered to question the, the experts because it's like, let's go back to the simple assumptions. Um, if you're not getting the simple assumptions right, then you're really complicated math on top isn't necessarily really relevant or helpful. So, mm -hmm. um, so, but I think they like to stay in the, in the complicated math here on top and, and not go back to the foundational assumptions, but that's where we have to question them on is like really like five-year-old questions like that people can understand and, and ask is what is money? Where does it come from? Um, how, you know, how is it recorded? I don't know. Um, right. And so, yeah. And, and so I don't know how that's going to, change or how we can hold them accountable you know i think it's maybe up to all of us but it, it is a it is a momentous change that needs to happen and, and like a lot of you know randy ray i mean he has very little hope of 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 the economist changing so that's why mmt decided you know they they tried to to talk to their peers you know in the economics profession and say hey you know here's here's all this other stuff here's all this other evidence um let's rewrite the textbooks and no one wanted to take them up on that. And so they got the most, you know, the most resistance is always from the, their their peers in, in the field of economics. Whereas, you know, if we take it outside, that's where people are willing to, to entertain these ideas and, and make a shift. And so I think, you know, that's why the film is important. Like other people, we, we all kind of have to talk to economists and say, hey, like, can you guys please start focusing your efforts on something that's relevant and accurate. Like there's so much work that I think, like, I don't really know what the job description of an economist is. Like what, <laughs> what are they supposed to do? I don't, I don't know. I mean, I can understand your, your trading and markets or your advising a president, but I don't understand what's in between that, you know? Right. And, and, well, and that's so, where economists go if they can't make it in markets and they can't make it anywhere else, they become <laughs> economists because uh, they can still get a paycheck. Right. <laughs> have, have, have no accountability. Yeah. 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 Right. yeah that's fully Warren so, Buffett has a had, had a line like a couple of years ago at the Berkshire Hathaway Hathaway uh, shareholder meeting where he was like, "Yeah, any company that that has an economist on the payroll has has uh, one employee too many." Yeah, <laughs> that makes sense. I've been wondering that for a while. I'm like, what what is useful about your you know inaccurate models that you could ever use in the real world? 
So yeah, so that makes a whole lot of sense is if you don't have a business case for your profession, you know, economists like to tell us, you know, right. go get retrained, right? Like, <laughs> right. I mean, please. So, but I mean, I think there's a lot of roles for accountants, you know, like people who yeah. know how to do accounting and, and that's, but economists skip over accounting. They like look down on accounting as, you know, and, and I think so much of MMT is just look at the real accounting, go back to accounting, um, right. look, you know, look at the, the numbers and the balance sheets and you won't get so lost if you remember to look at the dang balance sheet. So, <laughs> so yeah, I think there's a huge role of, you know, economists at the Fed and, and, you know, we need more economists, CBO at the Fed who are studying or, you know, analyzing real resources and real resource capacity and, you know, what, you know, if we do this policy, how much could that affect inflation through right. looking at a lot of intricate ways of the real world and real resource processing. But like the models they do today, like leave out all of that or leave out the real resources and capacity and inflationary impacts. All of that is ignored. It's just how much, how many dollars and how much uh, does that add to the debt? And that's it. That's the only thing they analyze. It's like, right, I, this is not useful. So, um, so I think there are useful things that, that economists can do and hopefully they can just need some slight retraining and then they can totally. be employed. Yeah, it's as we and we've talked about this a lot. Mm. How you know, so many people try to straw man MMT as saying, "Oh, MMT, you know, doesn't care about inflation." It says inflation's not a problem. When you know, on the contrary, in reality, MMT is putting inflation at the forefront of it's of the most policy, hawkish on inflation of, of yeah. policymaking. <laughs> you know, it's saying that economists and you know uh, policymakers should be focusing on the inflationary impact before any kind of budgetary impact. The budgetary impact is secondary. Mm -hmm. uh, to it, to the inflationary impact. And, mm -hmm. um, it's just, it, it, that, that point, I don't know. I just, I, I can't drive that point home enough because mm -hmm. I don't know how this straw man still exists that MMT doesn't care about inflation. Seriously. It is a good question. You know, I mean, they should call, call themselves the inflation hawks instead. Maybe they'd get some attention, you know, <laughs> it's like, we're the inflation hawks, you know? And I, I mean, cause the deficit hawk, I mean, what, you know, what does that mean? So it's, MMT should stake out the position that they are the, the inflation hawks and that they're the most concerned and that they think, you know, we should be studying it way more and, and, you know, really, really being careful about any policy proposal that it, you know, what are its inflationary impacts and how can we, can we minimize those? So, um, so yeah, there's a ton of work to do there. And I think that's an important, important rebranding. Maybe that could. <laughs> Good strategy. Aaron, I, I want to jump in. You had mentioned accounting, and I have a question that we'll get to accounting. It's the most exciting question imaginable, <laughs> especially on an audio podcast. Uh, but first, I, I just got to applaud you. The film was great. And you know, we talked about uh, taking a more scientific approach to economics when there's no scientific approach to economics out there. And and I felt like I was watching like a Carl Sagan Cosmos. Uh, like like a, uh, it, it really felt like I was watching a documentary that was really trying to explain the real world. And and it was like, a, I, I mean, the documentary came off as a, as a very enjoyable to watch, almost like scientific communicate, communicating documentary and it was just it was so good and i thought one of the things that was just absolutely best about it amongst i mean because you had to accomplish a lot of things all at once to get it to work which is you had to explain what the heck mmt is you had to explain why it even matters which you don't understand why it matters until you understand why it matters right so i mean you, you know you, you <laughs> yeah. got it you got to be and, and then on top of that you have to actually make a compelling film that people want to sit through and watch and you, one <laughs> you, you weaved it perfectly mm. um one of the questions I, I that, that I want to get to with accounting is I, I thought I don't want to give too much away about the film. But I thought the coolest part was the graphics that explain the accounting of MMT, because the the minute you pull out, I mean, I, you know, I'll do my live streams, I'll do my YouTube channels, and I, I can see when viewers turn off. And you know when they turn off is when I pull out my pen and I say, "Hey, we're gonna we're gonna do some uh, we're gonna do some balance sheets. We're gonna do we're gonna do some T accounts here, and, and we're gonna talk <laughs> assets and liabilities." And you know, all of a sudden, I have no retention left. But <laughs> but my you know my my mind when I have visualized in my head how this is all happening, you. you uh, Hopefully it's okay to give this away, but you use yeah. almost like this this particle thing, right? Mm. You, you have a plus and a, and a minus, and and mm. it and, and then there's a little string connecting the particles, so you can visualize this all happening in real time. That is absolutely brilliant. I think that's always what's going on in my mind. Uh. Did, did you think that through ahead of time? I mean, did you know that the accounting would be a difficult thing to explain in a movie format? Um, 
I, I really thought it was the coolest part. I, I know I'm like probably the only geek that thinks that, but I, I really thought it was like the best part that, that this movie's doing such a great job explaining the accounting because it's so important to understand the accounting if 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 you're going to understand you know how this thing actually works in total. So yeah, yeah, no, great question, um, and thank you. But yeah, I think I think just you know I think. All of this has always been in, in literature and in reading books and, you know, all of this. So it's like you're visualizing something in your mind and maybe I'm, you know, everyone has different, different learning and, you know, some people are more visual learners. So I guess I was just always envisioning it that way in a way, not always, of course, I think a major revelation for me was reading a book where they just very explicit. And I think, I guess it was Felix Martin's book. Um, I forget what it's called now, something money, but um and where he said, you know, just very explicitly was like, money always has two sides, you know, and that just really stuck with me as this, as a visual thing. And as such an important nature of money, like if that's when, where you get lost, if you start thinking that money is an object, um, is a lump of gold and is just right, a medium of exchange or is a commodity itself. If you instead think of money as always having two sides, like always kind of and, and almost like a magnetic force, you know, or like, it's like a plus and a minus for me. Like there's always a credit and a debt. There's always uh, an asset and a liability. And you have that balance, um, you know, would, for me remembering that, um, that's what if, you know, any financial instrument, it always has two sides on a balance sheet, right? There's, a, there's an asset and a liability. As long as you don't forget that, and as long as you're able to then trace that asset and that liability that are kind of connected through an umbilical cord or so, you know, some kind of magnetic energetic force, you know, you can see the, the credit traveling through the economy and, and, and who's holding the liability, where's the liability being held that can transfer as well, you know, but somehow they're always still revolving around each other. And then, then you can trace it, then you can track it, then you can say, this is what's going on. You know, it's accounting. So if you, if you're, if your numbers don't add up in the end, you, you did something wrong, right? So, um, so as long as you stick to that and it would just be a huge shift if instead of when someone says money, like, what do you visualize? You know, are you visualizing a lump of gold and a, or a gold coin, you know, or are you visualizing this, you know, this plus and minus the two, the two sides, like, don't forget that money has two sides who right. has, and who's holding it, who's holding the asset, who's holding the liability. If we just remember that, I think that would be a huge shift in how we understand money and the economy and kind of everything. So, um, so yeah, if, if that's the new visualization that we can use when whenever someone says the word money, um, I think that that could go somewhere. And that's what really stuck with me was that kind of revelation once I once I read that once once that was a major click, you know, one of those clicks clicking moments for me. Yeah, it's yeah. it's it's funny you say that because when I was first you know digging into MMT years ago, um, one of the things that stuck with me is when Warren Mosler talks about the government making social security payments. And he says, how do they make those payments? They, you know, all they do is they mark up, you know, the, the balance in your bank account on a keyboard, essentially. And he said, it's not like, you know, someone with a gold coin is sitting there and hammering the gold coin into the computer. And then you were <laughs> and that's your gold coin. He's like, it's just marking numbers up an account. That's how government spending works. And that always stuck with me. And I think, um, and Ryan and I talk about this all the time. It's just, for some reason, the idea that there's like this double entry accounting and that, all spending is income, you know, all, uh, all assets are liabilities at the same time. Um, even people who work in finance, uh, mm. they, they don't, they don't seem to get that. Mm. It's like if money is spent, then it's just gone. And that's mm. just, it's not how it works. Right. Right. No. And that's, that was a big question for me. And maybe for you guys too, is like, yeah, how do you think, you know, even I talked to some people on wall street and I'm like, well, what, you know, what is a treasury bond or, you know, sometimes, sometimes <laughs> they didn't fully think, that through or just like even like or, or no they, or they would say you know like what is the national debt it's the stock of treasuries that you're holding as your asset and some of them just didn't even make the leap from you know that's what the national debt just literally is right. um, because <laughs> most people on wall street they like treasuries or they like to hold them and 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 things like that and so um yeah there's a lot of little <laughs> connections that can be made and i always wonder it's like it's a question for me, like, because people in finance, right, they, they dedicated their lives to money um, and to markets and not understanding it. And so I just, I do get confused. Like, how could people who have been dedicating their lives to this and, you know, kind of doing it every day, um, like, what's going on in terms of, like, do they understand the accounting of it or what money is? Like, how I, I don't know how 
how you could spend every day of your life working with money and not really kind of understand what it is, I guess. That, that um, makes uh, that makes now four of us that are all in that exact same camp <laughs> on this podcast right now. I, it, you know, we, we've been we've been I've been doing this uh, you know kind of applied MMT approach for for a couple of years now, you know, publicly and and, and kind of aggressively, and and uh, I I was in the same boat that Warren Mosler was, where I'm like, you know, I, I was so worried uh, when I finally pieced all this together, and, and and that that I just give this information out for free, and then other people would just run run with it. I, I you know I wouldn't <laughs> I, I wouldn't get you know my share of it, and, yeah, and uh, and and so you know you go out there and you tell people. Um, this is this is what's going to happen. This is exactly how it's going to happen, and this is how it's going to end up. And a year later, it's exactly what happened, how it happened. And, where we ended up. and instead of being like, "Wow, you know, this is this makes complete sense," you're still told you're an idiot. You don't understand economics. And they, and they said it's not going to. You got lucky. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, or they'll come up with some you know thing that you know. But, but what about airline stocks? You didn't get it. I didn't, make a call on stock. I, I didn't say anything about airlines. What are you talking about? Like, you know, um, you know, they'll come up with some obscure thing. And I mean, you see this in the in the documentary where it's like, uh, you know, MMT is is just simply stating how uh, how how you know a money system works. And then all of a sudden it'll be like, well, yeah, but MMT doesn't explain you know why the sun rises. And it's like, well, yeah, that's, that's not what MMT is trying to explain. So I, you know, what, what do you want me to do? You know, what do you want me to do here? Um, and, and so, yeah, I, even in the finance world, I, I really thought like, like, God, I, I've got my one chance to get this. Everyone's going to realize what we've realized. Right. And, and then and then it's, it's just going to, you know, the, the minds are going to change. And uh, it was fun while it lasted. Nope. There, there, <laughs> there are very, very few converts care about getting it right. Apparently, I, I mean, they, they, um, they, they, they. They don't care about getting right. I really think part of it too, though, is and, and, and unfortunately, this sells in politics as much as it sells in finance as much as it uh, sells in economics. Is that uh, fear sells, right? And if mm-hmm. you can, if you can paint a a picture of, look, if we do this, the outcome is going to be terrible. We better not do this. And whether that is uh, taking action on you know on some of the social things that, that you've talked about, or or uh, j- just even you know investing your money in, in, in sound companies that, that have growth from a finance standpoint, whatever it might be, if there's someone that's like, yeah, but you, you know what might end up happening is we might get hit by an asteroid and then we're all broke, <laughs> you know, you know, so, some, you know, something like that. Uh, and and in the, you know, in this case, if the government debt gets too big, you never know, right? Right. And that's and you, you know, you, you don't you don't want to become Weimar Germany. We all learned about that in school. You don't want to become uh, a, a, a country that just implodes. And so that fear sells. And, mm. and that's all you have to do is say, well, it could end up very bad. Uh, yeah. and, and I, I do think that is one one element where, um, you know, economists, politicians and, and the finance bros all sell that same fear uh, very, very successfully. Yeah. And crypto, you know, like (laughs) trying to understand the crypto craze, it just stems from the same thing, that same fear based misunderstanding based, you know, I think understanding of money, like that always been crying and hyperinflation, right? Since Mm. 2008. Like yeah. oh hyper you know, <laughs> hyperinflation is coming the the QE QE is the Fed is printing trillions is going to cause hyperinflation it's like they have never been right and <laughs> and so you know and, and then yet they're like it could happen they they honestly truly believe it could happen tomorrow it could happen right. any day because we don't know how this like you know because they do think the economy is like this natural mysterious thing and like they don't understand how it works so they're like anything could happen you know anything could happen we don't know when the you know the spirits will just say up oh, hyperinflation tomorrow you're done you know it's like <laughs> <laughs> i mean there's no backing or you know or logic behind it either it's you know so or you know all of a sudden the bond market will turn on you or the you know the bond vigilantes they just don't drop that who's um, gonna keep buying the debt <laughs> yeah yeah and it, it, it keeps coming out every you know every week every month it, the, yeah yeah so i mean there's so there's so much there and and yeah i do have a ton of questions around that and yeah even for you i, I was curious you know it's like okay you're telling this you know you're giving away the secrets and it's kind of interesting it's like altruistic like you're trying to share this you're trying to help other people make money even though you'd think oh you you should be wanting to hoard it for yourself or hoard the information so you can make all the money you know but it's so interesting that like you're trying to share you're trying to help other people and they're like no you're crazy so, you, know, no. you know what's why with the bitcoin stuff right and the, the hyperinflation mm. all right so since 2008 uh, great financial crisis right uh, afterwards the response was going to cause hyperinflation We've uh-huh. gone from a, a roughly ten trillion dollar national debt. We're now at over thirty trillion dollar national debt. 
right? So twenty trillion in additional and national debt, and to show for all of that, right? The big worry is that the dollar was going to collapse and all that sort of stuff. The dollar is up about what forty percent since the low in two thousand and eight, right? And the U.S. has spent more than any other developed nation. So, I mean, out of Europe and, and the other developed nations, the U.S. has outspent every other nation by far. Probably not enough, but still mm. by far. And yet here we are, no hyperinflation. And then the one blip of inflation that maybe they could hold on to evaporated uh, in about 12 <laughs> months. Um, <laughs> so, Evaporate is a good term. Uh, yeah, evaporated. Mm. Yeah. And uh, and so I, I, I agree that the uh, the hyperinflation that is that I'm still that I'm still waiting on. What really yeah. sucks, too, is I bought into that back in 2008. I, mean, I really, really <laughs> thought that that's what was going to happen. I, I bought my gold bars. Yeah. No, I mean, the fear was palpable. Like, me too. Like, I was like, that makes sense. I should buy gold. Yeah, definitely. Like, I was scared. You know, it was like things felt like they were falling apart and no one knew why in 2008. Right. And yep. no one did, except for like a few random MMT yeah, people like in Kansas Mosler, City. Ray, <laughs> yeah, there were like five of them in Siberia, right? right. And they're like trying <laughs> Siberia, to get on. St- right. They started to get on Twitter then, but you know, no one had heard of them at right. that point, like a few people. And so, but that was like the time when they had so much relevant to say, you right. know, and just trying to, you know, trying to get themselves out there and be like, whoa, like everyone is getting this wrong, especially after 2008. Um, the hysteria, I mean, the debt hysteria, the, the hyperinflation hysteria, the QE, the conspiracies around the Fed, you know, and there's there's so much to break down and there was so much. And like, it just felt like even the economists were like, this is a total mystery, you know, good luck. Like we're right. probably heading towards Armageddon. And, and then the, like the whole culture became like very Armageddon focused, I feel like. Uh-huh. So, and I just want to relieve some of that, right? I mean, it's like, do we have to have so much fear around hyperinflation and that drives you to to bitcoin and, and very risky you know very risky speculative investments like thinking that thinking that you're trying to protect yourself from an an incoming disaster you know i think yeah i really i think it's really important to to and i don't know how economists get away with predicting this kind of doom right. uh, you know doom and gloom doomerism and yet you know there's no there's just no basis for it um of course, yeah, you need to be cautious. And yet climate change, you know, and some real doom in the forecast is irrelevant. So somehow that'll just be fine. And the economy will only be slightly hindered by a slight, you know, decrease in GDP growth if we have five degrees Celsius, Celsius warming, as uh, Nordhaus would say. Yeah, I mean, I mean, let's talk about that for a sec. Like if you if there is some sort of really, really, really catastrophic um uh, you know, event that happens over the next decade or two is that's climate change related, and and there's something that where that actually um, destroys the physical sort of capital stock of the country, mm-hmm. right? That you can absolutely have a situation where um, where inflation goes up a lot because yeah. you literally have this supply shock uh, because you're. Your real productive capacity just got, you know, a big chunk of it just got wiped out overnight. I mean, I think uh, with 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 Weimar Germany, my mm-hmm. understanding is like, you know, basically overnight, uh, you know, you had the the Rhineland or whatever where that had, I, I think it's, if, uh, if I'm getting it right, yeah. that had like a huge, um, you know, part of the the country's GDP uh, where they did a lot of kind of industrial activity around there and stuff, and then boom, overnight. Uh, I think uh, I, I don't remember exactly what happened, but it, but it all but they lost like seventeen percent of their GDP basically overnight. Like that is a real when we talk about real supply shocks, that's a yeah. real supply shock, and yeah. so that is something where that can actually lead to literal inflation, and 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 that is a real risk that has to be you know that we that you know we we have to factor into when, when we think about um, you know models and projections. Um, yeah. For uh, for the for the country. Well, the you know, the sad thing about that is we just lived through it with the pandemic, and everyone is still blaming you know government spending. <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, so like so, suddenly you know we have zero interest rates forever uh, for you know since the financial crisis, we get this crazy pandemic that blows up the world economy, and everyone looks at the government spending as the cause for uh, the price increases and not you know the real resource uh, issues we were all facing. Yeah. So yeah. I, I don't know what it's going to take to change that. I really don't. 
Yeah, well, <laughs> a lot needs to change. But yeah, I think- you would have thought a pandemic that shut the entire global economy down uh, would have changed the uh, the mindset of people. But uh, as it turns out, I know that's, even, even I mean, that doesn't change the mindset of people. Yeah. That's why I don't think I could ever be an economist because you can argue in circles and like never get anywhere. Um, you know, so it just because it, it is, it's like theory. It's, you know, you're not debating something real necessarily. So you can talk in circles and disagree forever. So it is frustrating. Um, or it's politics. You know, I, I like to say economics is really just at its root politics. That's it. Like there is no other uh, field there in a lot of ways. You know, it's, it's, it's made up. It's what, whatever we decide we want it to be. Um, but I think like, you know, talking about supply shocks, it, it, like in the film, you know, we kind of say like climate change is the biggest risk to inflation looking forward. I mean, there are big risks. Um, and so I think the ironic thing is, you know, the Great Depression, the, the 2008 global financial crisis, all of those were not real shocks, right? Like there was yeah. like the Great Depression an asteroid didn't hit the, you know, America and we all of a sudden lost tons of our labor force and our real resources. Like it was just a random stock market crash. And, and like, just like, you know, the, the, the how the, the function, the monetary system stopped functioning very well. And that's kind of the, the energetic flow of the economy, like the, you know, the, what we need to keep the, everyone, you know, functioning, but like we didn't lose any real capacity there. And right. we never had to have such a, a terrible, you know, depression, a terrible time where people starved and, you know, such high unemployment, mm. so many problems. Like we could have always recovered from that very quickly. The government could have always spent what it needed to and could have spent a lot more than it even did with the New Deal. I mean, right. FDR was on the right track starting to spend and to hire people and employ people and do it like so much was accomplished. So much infrastructure was built then, right, that mm. we still use today. Um, and so, it's like, you know, seeing it through that lens is just so ironic that that was just purely a monetary problem. It was not a real resource problem. We had the same amount of people as we did in the roaring 20s, you know, when the economy was doing right. fine. There right. was no there was no real shift. And so people just and people still today are like, you know, what caused the depression? How, you know, it's like it's it's pretty clear and it's pretty clear the government could have spent a lot more to hire all those people and build a better world that we you know, that we could be living, you know, building even more infrastructure that we could be using today, the real wealth of a nation, you know, is what you build and what you leave to future generations is, yeah, the real capital you've built, the houses, the infrastructure, the technology, the knowledge, the universities, the research capacity, you know, all of that is, is what you leave. And so, you know, that's what you lose if you, if you, if you're not investing, you know, public investment in, towards all of those things. And so, you know, we saw in world war two that we could ramp up all that spending and the, Instead that, you know, the economy recovered, we had full employment in World War II, but it wasn't to build a better country for ourselves or the world, you know, it wasn't to build something better, it was to go bomb and destroy, you know, Europe. And so, right. and, and elsewhere. And so, you know, it's just so ironic, all these things. But now I feel like, and same thing with the global financial crisis, it was just a financial problem. And Warren Moser will always say, that's easily solved. You right. know, that can be easily solved through, for, through fiscal spending. Um and, and other things. But, and of course, you know, the real problems in the housing market, there was a lot of fraud and, and all of that that should have been regulated. But, um, you know, looking forward, I do think the ironic thing is economists are always talking about like, how can we get economic growth? How can we get economic growth? Um, they're trying so hard for it. It's like a mystery too. It's like, well, just spend more, you know, like, I mean, and also, you know, invest and spend more. Um, but now I think we're getting to a phase where it's like, we do... Like economic growth should be the really easy part. Like that should be the easy part. The hard part now is looking at, you know, how do we actually live within planetary boundaries and still have increasing quality of life and well-being um, mm -hmm. on this planet and without causing issues that do undermine our real capacity. You know, there's this concept of overshoot. You know, we could very easily overshoot the capacity of the of the planet and all of a sudden you have climate change you have a lot of natural disasters that destroy you know our real capital and and the amount of people that can actually survive on the planet then you know it's like if we start destroying our real resources then we are creating conditions where um there's going to be major problems inflation would definitely be one of them um and so you know if you start destroying your real productive capacity your, your real resources that's when you you run out of problems and economic growth will be much harder in that kind of, I think, environment. Right. So well said. Very well said.
Martin, I, I, oh, I, oh, oh, sorry. I actually, I wanted to ask you, um, so I know you started making the film before the pandemic. Um, and then obviously, you know, the pandemic occurs and we have this inflationary episode that no one's seen in 30, 40 years. How did that, how did that affect the filmmaking process? Yeah. I mean, it, it just, I guess it just kind of slowed it down a little bit, but I was, you know, cause I was, I was trying to follow everything that was going on or, you know, I probably would have shot more and traveled a little more and didn't, you know, didn't work shooting, but I, I decided, okay, well, I guess I've got enough. Maybe, you know, it's, I don't know. It's the first film, I guess I was like, I think this is enough material. So I'm going to try to start editing. And, um, so that's when I really just moved into the editing phase okay. and, um, continued to collect material. And then I did do some more interviews once the pandemic settled down a bit more, right. um, a few more supplementary interviews and, but yeah, man, it was a long editing process of trying to figure it out and trying to figure out how to edit myself and, and having help from others. And, um, like you said, it's just, it is such a puzzle to kind of tell this story in a way that's compelling. And, you know, and, and the, like, I was always trying to find the right order, you know, it's so tricky. I was like, yeah. you, know, you should be able to like, just outline it and be like, okay, this makes sense on paper. This is a good outline on paper. But like, when you actually start getting into it, I would have, I had each scene kind of edited in a, in a way to a certain extent, each scene. And then it was just a matter of like, moving the order around like a puzzle so many times and there's kind of an infinite amount different orders that you could try them in and it was very surprising like how many different orders could almost work like there was right. there is no just like one order um that this story should be told in but so it was really just trial and error trying to figure out what fits what feels right um what makes logical sense but it, it, i guess it was just a feeling of like finally things falling into place but man it took a long time of just like constant reordering but. You know, I, I got to tell you, I thought you did a great job on that whole part. I, as someone who, I, I mean, I'm, I'm not a filmmaker by <laughs> by any means, but uh, you're a streamer, does, though. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> but it's so it's so hard because there always are those things where I'm like, I'm going to tell you about this in the future. You have to know this piece that I haven't told you about yet. Yeah. But I still have to tell you this part right now, and it is so difficult. And yeah. and I, I it, it is a it is a tough story to tell. And again, I, I, I to, to anyone who has anyone who you, you know you, you want to get more involved in economics and understand economics. This is going to be an awesome, awesome movie to point people to for that exact reason, because you absolutely nailed it with that part right there to, to get people to understand the money story from beginning to end. Tell a tell a compelling story, make it watchable, and then also never lose them along the way where they can't understand, OK, what the heck's happening here with this economics balance sheet stuff? No. I, yeah, you, you did it. You did a great job. And, and I can tell I can tell. The other thing I tell, too, is one, not only a great filmmaker, but two, um, just the, the intelligence to grasp. It's like you. You, it, it, it's amazing that you uh, directed, edited, and also learned MMT along the way with, with, the, <laughs> with, with, with the precision to uh, to tell the story the way you did. Because there was never a time where I'm like, yeah, I don't know about that. I mean, <laughs> it, it, it was always just just right on point throughout. And, mm-hmm. and I applaud you for just the amazing job you did to to, to weave the narrative um, mm-hmm. without without dropping a, a beat on on the actual facts of uh, of the underlying content. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah. And- and it, yeah, it, I felt like I had a, I had to have a, the best grasp I could before I started. And, you know, it, but it was definitely a learning process throughout too. And, you know, it's kind of the best way to learn is to, to teach too. So, um, you know, it's like, how do you communicate, how can you communicate these ideas clearly and synthesize them and clarify them in your own mind? So, um, so yeah, it's definitely a process um, with a lot of trial and error, but, um, you know, Randy Ray and others were just very helpful along the way as well. Um, so so yeah, and it, yeah, it was it's you know trying to build on on everyone else's work, of course, as well. Awesome, have you, Ryan. Was there? Um, have you found that uh, engaging with any other um, heterodox economists has been um, like I've never heard of another you know uh, documentary film where it's like oh this other uh, you know heterodox school of economics that's not i mean mmt is just so it's just so different um you know like you know in your kind of um work did you did you find that uh um you know you speaking with other uh heterodox schools of 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 thought or anything like what 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 do you mean like if i just came across is there any like crossover with different um uh like school like heterodox schools of economics like i've I've heard Mm -hmm. that the i think it's uh at UMass, they have like a heterodox 
mm. um, economics program where I think mm. that's where Isabel Weber is from and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah just really curious because it's such an interesting, like you don't hear about, you know, other uh, heterodox uh, economics being, you know, a film being made out of them for, uh, mm. out of it, for example. So I'm just mm. kind of, uh, curious. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, honestly, I probably would have, you know, I, I guess it, it is even just funny that there are so many heterodox schools of it. It's like, does this exist in other fields, you know, where there's like a million, <laughs> like a lot of branches that are trying to criticize the, the mainstream branch. But, um, yeah, so it maybe says something about economics itself that there are so many heterodox schools, but, um, because the critiques are necessary, but, um, yeah, I mean, I think, like some very prominent and I think a lot of the heterodox schools you know do uh, not conform but you know agree on some of their critiques and angles and saying you know I'm I'm very happy to see now like ecological economics is also a, a heterodox school and huh. um they're very different from you know environmental economics which is really just neoclassical um and so they're really integrating now with MMT you know there's recent papers that have come out saying um with Jason Hickel and, and two other co-authors, um, they, you know, just had a recent paper called how to pay for saving the world, uh, you know, MMT and, and degrowth kind of synthesis. Um, and so it's very interesting, you know, this ecological economics world, they've kind of, they've understood certain aspects of the, of, of money, but now they're like, this money piece is really the piece that we've been missing like this whole time, uh -huh. you know, they're like, when we finally found MMT and now are integrating it, they're like, this kind of makes our theory whole and we can understand um, they have a vision for the future of, you know, how economies can function necessarily without GDP growth or, you know, have a vision for how to live within planetary boundaries. And yet they were like, we, they, they were always kind of stopped or the, this big obstacle that was, well, how could you have that? Or how could you have a functioning economy if, you know, we don't have increasing tax revenues and increasing growth to pay back the debt or to how are you going to pay for these social services like like social security or public transportation or more public provisioning of things? You know, they were always stopped by that money piece. How how could how could an economy function if it's not growing in a way? Um, and so so there's a lot, you know it depends totally how you define growth, right? So there's a lot of movements even in the mainstream saying we need to redefine growth from being GDP growth to being growth in well being and other measures of of societal, yeah, societal well-being, health, longevity, all these other metrics that we can use that actually measure the progress of society. Um, and so, so, so anyway, so I think there's really exciting synthesis happening there, and the work of Stephen Hale and Modern Money Lab down in um, Australia, and they're they're doing amazing work with their oh. new, um, you know, online graduate program. And I have to say, you know, they're sponsoring a little tour for us down in Australia. In March, um, we'll be Stephanie will be coming down, and myself, and we'll be screening in different cities. And there, so they're doing amazing organizing on the ground, and <clears throat> they're really synthesizing those schools. And um, and yeah, and I think it's so important. You know, it's so interesting. There's there's a lot of women economists, you know, challenging the, the mainstreams. So you have Kate Rayworth, um, you know, with Donut Economics. You have Mariana Matsukato with the Mission Economy. Now you have Isabel Weber with Inflation. Um, you know, and then the developing economists pair, you know, there's this whole development economics paradigm that I think MMT really provides a very different paradigm for thinking about developing economies. You know, unfortunately, we're not able to cover that in the film, but I think that's some of the most exciting stuff, you know. And so, so yeah, I think there's, there's a lot of room for, for integration and um, combining a lot of these ideas ideas like each each school maybe brings a piece that's their emphasis but they can be synthesized too um so so anyhow i don't know if that answers your question or where i was yeah no that, that was great well marin i know we're we're coming up on time here um where where can people find more about the film yeah so definitely so our website is the best place now findingmoneyfilm.com um and sign up for our email list it'd be really great and we can keep in touch about screenings that are going to be happening through the spring um <clears throat> and then like i said we'll be releasing widely in or probably early may we just signed on you know with the distributor for north america um so Congrats. it'll be yeah so the u.s and canada in theaters and then um and then it'll be available wherever you rent movies like you know Google or iTunes or Apple TV or uh, YouTube. 
Where? What? Blockbuster. Blockbuster. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I wish. Yeah. Uh, no, we may we may be selling DVDs, you know, all sorts of stuff, so you can get it as a present. Um, but anyway, yes, there's. Uh, please just sign up on our website. We have like more resources there too, which list the myriad of podcast great podcasts on the subject and and books and articles where you can really dig into more if you're hopefully you know inspired by by the story like some of us are and so um and so yeah there's a lot of important resources that the film doesn't cover but i think you know there's a lot to discuss and a lot of implications so maybe i'll put some energy towards like extra scenes to release um to delve into some of these other issues because yeah i'd love to talk more about interest rates and inflation and um (laughs) and all of that i really yeah but i just could not fit that (laughs) into the film without people totally losing it (laughs) so um yeah Awesome. Well, thank you so much uh, for joining today. It was great to have you on. Really enjoyed the conversation. Yeah, no, thank you guys so much for having me. I really enjoyed it, you know, talking with you all and meeting you. So please do. I hope to see you at our New York screening. I'll let you know. Hopefully oh, definitely. We'll have, we will have like a week long run in New York. So get all the Wall Street folks out um, and everyone else too. So that'll be exciting. Amazing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> thank you, right. Warren. Yeah, no, thank you guys so much.